We are extremely grateful that uh, these three scholars could come today, and we're extremely grateful for the Frankel Foundation uh, for having this lecture series. It's in its 17th year, uh, and for the Houston Law Review uh, for working so hard to coordinate uh, these papers coming. Our first, the main speaker uh, today is David Skeel. He's as the program has information about uh, all of their backgrounds, uh, but I'll, I'll introduce the speakers quickly now and then we'll uh, have them get started. Uh, professor Skeel is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania uh, who writes on commercial law and corporate law, which in the law school world is a bit of a rarity, and so it's, uh, he's in a unique position to be able to comment on these issues. He's written about Dodd-Frank uh, in a series of complicated provisions over the last uh, years in his scholarship, uh, and he is uh, the leading voice in talking about uh, how to resolve uh, huge bankruptcy issues. The first commenter uh, is Professor, An professor Anna Gelpern, who's a professor at the American University. She has an interesting perspective on these issues because she's an expert in sovereign debt. And so she's written a lot about uh, the European crisis. And so she brings a, a, a different uh, perspective to uh, one of the topics that Professor Skeel is going to be talking about. And our final, final speaker is Clayton Gillette, who's a professor at NYU. Uh, and like Professor Gelpern, he also brings a different perspective to these issues. He uh, teaches and writes about local government and commercial law. And so it's the perfect uh, place to talk about municipal bonds and municipal debt. Uh, and he's, uh, for many years, has written on uh, these sorts of issues. And I think we'll have a, you know, an interesting perspective from uh, sovereign debt and then an interesting perspective on the intersection between local government. Uh, and uh, as Texans, uh, we, the city of Houston is not, uh, as I understand it currently, considering bankruptcy, but if you've gone to vote yet, you know that the final nine or so items are the city taking on bonds. And so this is certainly relevant to us, uh, even though the discussion today will focus mainly on the back end of those transactions uh, when things go south. So please welcome uh, Professor Skeel with me, uh, and we'll enjoy the conversation. Thanks, Jim. And thanks to uh, Peter and Angelus and Casey and the, the Law Review and to the Frankel Foundation for putting this together. Um, it is a thrill to be here. And I think I can speak for all three of us when I say we are even happier to be here than we would have been a few weeks ago. Uh, two days ago, I was in my basement bailing water out with buckets by hand and uh, uh, bringing out my inner George W. Bush by uh, taking out a chainsaw and cutting up trees that had fallen in our yard. Clay has been walking up and down uh, nine sets of stairs to get to his apartment in New York City because he too has not had power all week, still doesn't have power, so you may have Clay here permanently. Um, Anna is in DC and so she didn't get hit quite as bad, but she has been spending a lot of quality time with her kids, I think, in the last um, few days, which is wonderful. Um, uh, but as I said, we are, we are thrilled to be here. Um, uh, it couldn't have come at a better time as it, as it worked out. When the editors of the Law Review contacted me about a year and a half ago about doing this lecture on these issues, we were given specific marching orders, I was, needless to say, incredibly flattered. But I also wondered whether the issues would still be relevant now. We don't usually, in the law school world, plan things a year and a half out. I thought that by 2012, state and city bankruptcy might not be particularly interesting issues to anyone. Unfortunately for the states and cities of the country, but I suppose fortunately for this debate, the issues are every bit as relevant today as they were a year and a half ago. Two years ago, starting in late November 2010, a fierce debate erupted over the question whether Congress should enact legislation that would allow troubled states to file for bankruptcy. Now, as some of you probably know, 
Cities and counties currently can file for bankruptcy because of Chapter 9 of our bankruptcy laws. There's no set of provisions that allows states to file for bankruptcy. So the question was, should we change that? Should we create a way for California or Illinois, uh, if things keep going the way they had been going, to file for bankruptcy? Now, I played a small role in this debate in 2010 as a result of a magazine article in an op-ed that I wrote arguing that states should be able to file for bankruptcy. As this debate heated up in late 2010, I got more and more excited. I was getting calls from people who typically didn't call me. Uh, I was getting calls from reporters and House and Senate staffers. And I started to think this might be one of those rare occasions when a law professor can actually influence something that's happening um, legislatively. But then, after about four or five weeks, all the excitement suddenly died. So there's this big debate, really exciting for a few weeks, then it disappears. Looking back, I think it was a little bit as if God had said to me, Skeel, you aren't Elizabeth Warren. You're not going to change policy in Washington and don't even think about running for the Senate. Go back and write law review articles and do the things that you're paid to be doing. And so that's what I've done um, since this debate quieted down. I've written uh, several law review articles, a little bit more formal than the magazine in the op-ed. And then uh, the piece that will come out in connection with this lecture is, in a sense, the capstone, I hope, of this sequence um, of articles. I haven't completely given up hope that Congress uh, might revisit these issues. And I, I think um, one of the, uh, I, don't know I'd call, I don't think I'd call it a silver lining, but one of the effects of the hurricane, which the current estimates of the damages are right now about $50 billion, is that I think it may re-raise all of these issues. The question of what, what the federal role is, what the state role is, how do we deal with financial distress. So I haven't given up hope that this idea will actually get some more serious dis, uh, discussion in Washington. It is not getting serious discussion now. As I said, the debate died after four or five weeks of, um, of being debated. If you're wondering why, the campaign for state bankruptcy petered out so quickly, and many of you probably didn't even notice it because it rose and fell so quickly. The short answer is that it was silenced through a rare show of bipartisan agreement. Democrats and Republicans obviously don't agree on a whole lot these days, at least if you're not Chris Christie or uh, Michael Bloomberg. Um, but they did agree that states should not be permitted to restructure their obligations in bankruptcy. Democrats hated the idea because it was initially pitched, the idea that states should be able to file for bankruptcy, initially pitched by several Republican politicians, Newt Gingrich and Jeb Bush in particular, as a way to whack public employee unions by forcing public employee unions in states like California in particular, um, Illinois was the second most frequently mentioned, to restructure their collective bargaining agreements. At that point, the bond market started whispering in the ears of various Republican politicians, including Eric Cantor, the second leading um, Republican in the House, and saying that if state bankruptcy were enacted, the bond markets would just go haywire, um, not just in the states that were in trouble, but in other states as well, and it would be Armageddon if state bankruptcy were enacted. Eric Cantor listened to these bond market folks, and in January 2011, he issued a statement that essentially said, over my dead body, will there be any legislation having anything to do with state bankruptcy? And at that point, it was clear um, there were any remotely enough votes um, for something like this to go forward. What I'm hoping to do in the next 25 minutes and in our conversation um, afterwards is to persuade you that both parties were wrong about this and that putting a state bankruptcy law in place actually is a good idea. I'll start by briefly describing the argument for state bankruptcy as I see it. 
I'll talk about the implications of several key developments that have taken place since the debate fizzled out. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about three. I'm going to talk first about the spate of municipal bankruptcies that we've seen since then. Bankruptcies involving cities and counties like Jefferson County, which is where uh, Birmingham is uh, in Alabama. Um, Stockton in California, Harrisburg in my state of Pennsylvania has tried to file for bankruptcy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the significance of these developments and what we can learn from them. Second, I'm going to talk about the Supreme Court's health care decision that came out this summer, which seems to me to raise some interesting constitutional law issues about state bankruptcy. And then finally, I'll talk for a minute or two about the crisis in Europe and what Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal have to do with this discussion. Now, I should note before I jump in, as, as should probably already be apparent from Jim's welcoming remarks, Anna and Clay are the two best people in the world to be having this conversation um, with. Anna is one of the leading sovereign debt and international finance um, people in the world. Clay is the leading local government person, at least in this country, maybe in the world as well. They have both written on this issue. They haven't entirely complimented what I've had to say. Um, they've been, been critical, but critical in very constructive ways. So I think this is um, going to be the perfect conversation um, over the next hour or so. So let me start with the theoretical foundations of the case for state bankruptcy. The key theoretical argument that I want to get into your minds is that when we're thinking about state bankruptcy and trying to analogize it to, um, to bankruptcy that we already have in other contexts, the analogy to think about is not corporate bankruptcy, which is what everybody wants to compare state bankruptcy to. It is, surprisingly enough, consumer bankruptcy. Consumer bankruptcy tells us more, in my view, about whether state bankruptcy is a good idea or not. So why do we have corporate bankruptcy and why is it not as relevant to state bankruptcy? The main theoretical argument for corporate bankruptcy is that if we didn't have a formal organized restructuring process, the creditors of a troubled business, as they tried to collect what they're owed, could dismember an otherwise viable business. So the idea is if everybody raced to collect what they owed, if there's no way to coordinate them, we could dismember a business and it could end up being liquidated. We need bankruptcy to provide an orderly, collective response to financial distress. Now, if you think about states for a minute, those arguments don't apply in anything like the same way. Creditors of a state can race to the courthouse, but they're not likely to get that much when they get there. It's very hard to sue a state. Clay and Anna have both talked about this um, in their work. And at least so far, it's not possible to liquidate a state the way you could liquidate a corporation. Now, some people might want to liquidate a state or two, um, and which ones you might want to liquidate depends a little on where you're standing. Um, but so far, you can't really do that the way you can with a corporation. How about consumers? Why do we let consumers file for bankruptcy? Well, two of the main reasons are, First, that if a consumer is completely overwhelmed by debt, it might not be in anybody's best interest for them to continue to try to pay off the debt. They'll be so discouraged that creditors actually won't get any more and the consumer is not going to do any better. We also operate on the view that consumers have natural decision-making biases, that um, many people, most people, have a tendency to consider short-term benefits more heavily than long-term costs. So you focus more on the short-term benefits of borrowing money. You don't always think as much as you should about the long-term costs of that money. And as a result, you can end up being overwhelmed by debt. 
The theory, or one of the main theories behind consumer bankruptcy, or some of the main theories, are that consumer bankruptcy gives consumers a fresh start because they can be overwhelmed by debt, and that consumer bankruptcy puts the consumer's creditors in a position of needing to pay attention to whether the consumer is likely to repay or not. Um, so consumer bankruptcy puts a little bit more on the on of the onus on creditors um, on the view that creditors probably are better decision makers in some respects than consumers are. Now maybe this isn't true in Texas, but in many states, states and state decision makers are an awful lot like consumers in their tendency to borrow too much and to focus more on short-term benefits of that borrowing um, than they focus on the long-term costs. If you want to put the analogy completely uh, together, to bring them completely together, you might think of state politicians as a little bit like a teenager with a credit card. Um, and my argument is that this is the way theoretically, at, at, first, at the level of first principles, to think about whether state bankruptcy is a good idea or not. In more detail, let me give you five reasons why state bankruptcy would make things better rather than worse, very quickly. The first is that even though no state, even if no state ever actually filed for bankruptcy, the existence of a bankruptcy option might encourage a state's creditors to restructure obligations outside of bankruptcy. So the stick of bankruptcy, the possibility of bankruptcy, could encourage negotiations even outside of bankruptcy. Second, as I noted a moment ago, state lawmakers have an incentive to borrow too much because they can enjoy, to the extent they can borrow, they can enjoy the benefits of the borrowing today and push off the repayment until later. The possibility that these obligations could be restructured in bankruptcy would encourage a state's creditors to be a little more careful about whom they lend to and when, and when which could help counteract a state's tendency to borrow too much and also states' tendency to promise too much in terms of, of pensions to state employees. Third, bankruptcy could make it possible to restructure obligations that are difficult or impossible to restructure in the absence of bankruptcy. Two key examples here are bond debt and generous pensions. Bankruptcy could permit a state to restructure its bond obligations if, for instance, a majority of the bondholders voted to agree to the restructuring. This cannot currently be done outside of bankruptcy. In many states, pension obligations are all but impossible to adjust in any meaningful way outside of bankruptcy, even if the pensions are radically underfunded, as they are in states like Illinois. I believe, and I'm, this is a little bit tangentious, not everybody agrees with me, but uh, I, I believe this is accurate, that's in bankruptcy, so long as pension beneficiaries were given at least the amount of the funding that's been set aside for them, the underfunded portion could be restructured um, in bankruptcy. Not necessarily it would be or would be restructured completely, but there would be a restructuring range in bankruptcy that's not available outside of bankruptcy. Fourth, bankruptcy could ensure a more equitable distribution of the sacrifice in a severe crisis than we currently get. As we've seen in the past few years, in the absence of bankruptcy, when a state is in financial distress, the costs are borne almost entirely by two constituencies, recipients of services and state public employees. In bankruptcy, by contrast, there is a general rule of equity that says that similarly situated creditors need to be treated similarly. As a result, although this doesn't work perfectly in bankruptcy, 
it is more likely, in my view, that the, the sacrifice of financial distress would be shared among a broader range of constituencies than it is outside of bankruptcy. Finally, our only existing alternatives in the event of severe distress are a massive federal bailout of the troubled states or for the states simply to default. Bankruptcy offers a more orderly response without the cost and the problems that bailouts cause. Now, as I've already said, not everybody thinks bankruptcy, state bankruptcy, is as great an idea as I do. And I have to admit that there are some very important concerns raised by people who are a lot smarter than I am, including two who are sitting at the table um, right over there. Uh, the first two objections are the concerns that doomed the state bankruptcy proposal in Congress. Republicans concerned about bond market contagion and Democrats concerned that bankruptcy would be used simply to whack public employee unions. I don't think either of those arguments is particularly compelling. The bond market objection assumes that bond markets can't tell the difference between profligate states like California and Illinois, on the one hand, and better run states like Iowa, and to some extent, Texas. Um, the current evidence that we have suggests that the bond markets can tell the difference, and that putting in place a state bankruptcy framework might um, have an effect in states like California, with the debt of states like California and Illinois, it's much likely to have an effect with respect to states like Iowa. And contrary to concerns that public employees will be singled out and that bankruptcy, um, excuse me, and contrary to concerns that public employees will be singled out, they've already been singled out even without bankruptcy. Uh, as I've already noted, and the sacrifice, in my view, might well be distributed more, equity, more equitably and more broadly in bankruptcy than it has been um, over the last couple of years, as we've seen restructuring of, of employee collective bargaining agreements in Wisconsin and, and other states. The third objection is that states' real problem is broken politics, um, and that a broken, political pro a broken political process needs a political solution and that bankruptcy can't provide that solution. It can't fix political problems. In my view, this is to some extent a fair objection. It is true that bankruptcy can't fix um, all of the problems that California, for instance, has politically now. But it does seem to me that bankruptcy can help to counteract those problems to some extent in the ways that I've already talked about, in the, uh, the incentives it gives the creditors of a troubled state to monitor that, that troubled state. And it's also important, in my view, to once again keep the consumer bankruptcy analogy in mind. Consumer bankruptcy doesn't fix decision-making problems either. Consumers still have an incentive, even after bankruptcy, to focus more on the short-term benefits of borrowing and not focus so much on the long-term costs. But we don't say we therefore shouldn't have a bankruptcy system. We don't say because it's not perfect, because it doesn't fully protect every problem, therefore we don't want the bankruptcy system. Fourth objection is that financial obligations are a relatively small sliver of what states do. States are not ordinarily profit-making enterprises. They have a whole lot of other functions that don't have a lot to do with profits. In sharp contrast, for instance, to a corporation, which, primar which is primarily designed to earn a profit. Once again, this seems to me true. It seems to me true that states do a lot of things that don't look like money making. But once again, it's also true of consumers. Um, and we don't say that because consumers have lots of other things they're concerned about, they're not solely trying to make a profit, that consumer bankruptcy is a bad idea. We think it's a good idea, and I think the same reasoning applies to states. 
The final objections stem from the fact that the federal government is already extensively involved in state financing. This is referred to in the literature as fiscal federalism. The most serious concern here, in my view, is a concern that Clay has raised in some of his work, and that is that if the federal government is even more worried about a state bankruptcy filing than the state is, the state can use that fear of the federal government strategically, that the state can threaten to file for bankruptcy as a way to force the federal government to give the state a bailout and a bailout on generous um, terms. So the idea is there's a risk that state bankruptcy would backfire, that currently there's not a huge incentive for, state, for the government to bail out the states, or if the government did bail out the states, um, they might attach pretty tough strings, but if we had state bankruptcy, if the federal government is really worried about a bankruptcy filing to, to prevent the state from filing, the federal government might give the state a big bailout. I do think this is a real concern. We don't know for sure how these strategic incentives would work, and they would be different probably from state to state. But it's also important to keep in mind, it seems to me, that states already have a threat they can make to the federal government. States, even without bankruptcy, can already say, unless you bail us out, federal government, we're just going to default. We're just going to stop paying our bondholders, or we're going to stop paying somebody else. In fact, a couple of years ago, Arnold Schwarzenegger in California started edging up to this threat. Probably nobody remembers, but he, he told Congress, you need to give us $10 billion this year, implicitly threatening that if the federal government didn't, um, California might default or might do something else. He later backed away from the threat, but it, it did seem to me to show that this, these strategic considerations are real. My view is that the strategic threat would be um, less um, if there were a bankruptcy framework in place than it is without bankruptcy, but, but that is subject to debate. In the two years since this debate began, three developments have taken place that seem to me to have very important implications for the question of state bankruptcy as well as for the financial distress of many American cities and counties. As I mentioned at the outset, although states can't file for bankruptcy currently, cities and counties can if their states permit this thanks to the enactment during the Great Depression in the 1930s of the provisions now housed in Chapter 9 of our Bankruptcy Code. For many years, the conventional wisdom was real cities don't use Chapter 9. Real cities don't ever file for Chapter 9. The only folks who use Chapter 9 are little bitty sewer districts and uh, little bitty water districts might file for Chapter 9, but no city of any consequence would ever file. What we've seen in the last two years is, is that at least now, real cities do file for Chapter 9. Jefferson County, which I've already mentioned, is in Chapter 9. Stockton and San Bernardino, California are in Chapter 9. And as I've already mentioned as well, Harrisburg in Pennsylvania has tried to file for bankruptcy over the last state or so, or the last year or so. During the same period of time, Michigan has enacted really remarkable um, state law provisions for dealing with financial distress that allow the state to put in place a, uh, an emergency manager under certain circumstances, an emergency manager, manager with quite extraordinary powers, including the power to terminate collective bargaining agreements if the manager thinks this is necessary. These bankruptcies and these developments in states like Michigan will, in a sense, be laboratories for the possibility of state bankruptcy. One very important development thus far, it seems to me, is that they suggest pensions may indeed be subject to fine-tuning in bankruptcy. Central Falls, Rhode Island, which has just emerged from bankruptcy over the last month or two, 
emerged with a reorganization plan that significantly restructured the pensions, the pension promises of its public employees. In addition to the spate of municipal bankruptcy filings, a second key development was the Supreme Court opinion upholding Obamacare last summer. Now, when most of you read about the opinion, I doubt that the first thought that occurred to you was the first thought that occurred to me, and that is, this might have really important implications for state bankruptcy. Uh, but even if you didn't have this thought, it does have important implications for state bankruptcy and state financial distress. In part of the decision that doesn't get as much attention as the individual mandate, the Supreme Court partially struck down the expansion of Medicaid in the health care legislation, concluding that it was an interference with state sovereignty. The court suggested that the constitutional protection of state sovereignty is designed not only to protect the interest of the states themselves, but also is a protection of individual liberty. So state sovereignty isn't just about the states, it's about having another sovereign who will, who is in a position to, whose sovereignty is in a position to, to protect individual liberty. This could be construed as meaning that even if a state consented to bankruptcy, state bankruptcy could be challenged by somebody who was affected by that bankruptcy. Now, I'm not a real constitutional law scholar, but I do enjoy pretending to be one. Um, my sense, which is confirmed by at least one colleague who is a real constitutional law scholar, is that state bankruptcy probably would be upheld even under the Supreme Court's new reinvigoration of state sovereignty because Congress has a bankruptcy clause that explicitly authorizes bankruptcy legislation. The final key development is the crisis in Europe. The European crisis is surprisingly relevant because as Anna has pointed out, the European countries that are part of the EU are a lot like states in some respects, and the, EU, the EU is a little bit like our federal government in relation to those individual states. In my view, having a bankruptcy framework in place in Europe would have enabled Europe to handle the distress in Greece and elsewhere more effectively than they've done. Another thing that they um, will have to be thinking about and have been thinking about is if they don't put in place a bankruptcy framework or a bankruptcy-like framework is um, they may need to consider creating a way for countries to get off of the euro. The final realistic option they have, it seems to me, is for the EU to exert more control over the finances of the individual European countries. However, with respect to that final possibility, it seems to me that in Europe, as in the US, that's really not an option that ultimately is seriously on the table. There would be too much resistance to the intrusion on um, an individual country's um, sovereignty. Uh, so when you put all this together, it seems to me that bankruptcy is an attractive option in Europe. Um, one major concern about bankruptcy in Europe is that there is, unlike in the US where I don't believe there's a legitimate contagion fear, there is a legitimate contagion fear in Europe. And that is that banks, systemically important banks, hold a lot of Greek and Italian and Spanish debt. And if there were a restructuring of those countries, there's a risk that you would have, you would create problems for the banking industry. In the US, the holders of state debt are disproportionately mutual funds and rich in-state residents because of the tax benefits of holding state debt. It seems to me that the contagion effect in the US or the contagion risk is much smaller than it is in Europe. So when we put the two situations together, in my view, it strongly reinforces the case for state bankruptcy. In my initial writings about state bankruptcy, I was a trifle polemical at times. I suggested that Congress should do its part by enacting a state bankruptcy law 
and that Jerry Brown, the governor of California, should immediately do his part by using that bankruptcy law. Now that the heat of the debate has cooled a little bit, I've tried to be a little bit more even-handed and a little bit less political, polemical, and I do acknowledge that the case for state bankruptcy is not a slam dunk, that there are good arguments on both sides. But I do think the case is strong, and I also think that the recent developments that I've been talking about have made the case even stronger. So thank you very much to uh, the Law Review, um, to the Foundation, and uh, to all our gracious hosts here. It's an honor and a privilege to be here, um, and to share the stage with David Skeel and Clay Gillette, from whom I've learned so much. Um, and David's generous introduction, pretty much forget about it. I can't live up to it, so there we go. Um, so um, my project today um, is actually to agree with David Skeel. <laughs> okay, so we're done. The very first thing I did when I um, kind of tried to become a law teacher uh, many, many moons ago was to pick a fight with David Skeel over priorities. I didn't know who he was, I just figured I'd disagree with this guy out there. <laughs> and then the minute I found out, I felt really terrible and I've felt guilty ever since, so this is why I'm here. Um, more importantly, um, I felt for the past 10 years really conflicted because I really like and respect most of the people supporting sovereign bankruptcy, at least internationally. I mean, these are all my friends and the thing I really want to do is agree with them. Um, moreover, I'm not really a contractarian by disposition. I like statutes, right? So I really, I just, I really want to be with the bankruptcy people, but I haven't been able to get myself there. Um, so I think today is the day. Um, and uh, a part of what gets me here is, of course, um, David's persuasive arguments, but the other part is recent developments in sovereign debt restructuring that I find really um, unnerving. Um, and I think, again, now that the heat of the debate has passed, um, I am also feeling totally free to admit that there is plenty wrong with the sovereign debt restructuring process uh, today. And you know we might as well think creatively about how to address this. Um, the problem I have had with uh, all, just about all the sovereign bankruptcy proposals to date um, is that they are either really discreet, like an aggregated majority voting provision for foreign bondholders. That's the famous IMF sovereign debt restructuring mechanism proposal, probably the most um, institutionally sort of articulated proposal of its sort, and one that got closest to being reality in modern history. Now, it was a really tiny little gizmo that went to a problem, uh, creditor coordination, that didn't really turn out to be a problem, right? So we borrowed this bankruptcy technique for reasons that were not entirely compelling in my view. At the other end of uh, the spectrum, you have proposals for bankruptcy as sort of motherhood and apple pie and fairness in general, right? So. NGOs, the Jubilee Coalition, have proposals for fair and transparent arbitration procedure, which are just a forum to make sure that human rights prevail in debt crises. And that's really hard to disagree with, but it's not exactly a, an actionable proposal. And so we've lurched from one to the other, and, it's, uh, and uh, David, to his credit, uh, more than anyone else, has made an effort to bridge the gap between an institutionally specific set of proposals and one that is um, kind of more abstract and uh, you know normative um, but perhaps not as institutionally granular. So in my remaining few minutes what I want to do is I want to kind of repeat um, survey some of the common arguments for sovereign bankruptcy and why I think that they don't really um, uh, cut it, why I think they miss the mark. Um, next, what I want to do is to talk about the things that are really bothering me with the process of sovereign debt restructuring and sketch out what elements of bankruptcy I think might fix them. And I will conclude with a couple of words on the federalism dimension, focusing mostly on Europe. Um, so with sovereign bankruptcy, we usually start with the debt problem, right? Governments have too much debt and or the wrong kind of debt. Um, the most uh, popular argument for sovereign debt relief is debt sustainability, right? Governments have, and this is along the lines of the argument that's also made with firms and people, 
um, too much debt is inefficient. It discourages investment, it discourages good policies because any painful reforms, um, the rewards go to creditors, right? That's, that's what happens when you have a debt overhang. Um, and that's something that economists think is sort of a mathematically determinable threshold. People argue about the formula, but very few argue about the fact that an optimal level of debt that is efficient actually exists. Um, there are two other arguments. One is that too much debt um, takes away the debtor's autonomy. That's an argument made by religious um, groups. Uh, you know, and uh, Pope John Paul famously had the Jubilee Proclamation. Um, and there is the legitimacy argument, which is the odious debt debate some of you might have heard about. And that is not so much that there is too much debt or too much, so much debt that the debtor is oppressed and loses autonomy, but rather that the debt itself is illegitimate. It's odious. It's incurred um, in a uh, morally wrong war. It in, it's incurred, you know, conflict, diamonds, that, kind of, that sort of argument. Um, its provenance is wrong. Um, the problem with these arguments is that they're not arguments for bankruptcy. They're arguments for debt relief, right? And a debt relief can be achieved with unilateral default, unilateral forgiveness, ad hoc renegotiation, and transfers, bailouts, debt assumption, all of which are prevalent in the world of sovereign debt. Um, as well as bankruptcy. But why are all the others used so frequently and bankruptcy not at all? I think we need an explanation and an argument for why bankruptcy is an improvement over these other frequently used um, approaches to debt relief. Other problems, and David has touched on some of them, coordination problems, right? The question, um, the idea that drove the debate 10 years ago um, that without bankruptcy protection, creditors will rush to the courthouse, strip assets. Empirically, now we have some empirical studies, this just has not been a problem. Um, and the, ex the reason why is sort of the elephant in the room. My view is that it's sovereign immunity, right? It's, and it's weird how infrequent dis the discussions of immunity have been in uh, the sovereign debt context. Now, I may be overly influenced by the fact that I you know, wake up to hate mail from German bondholders about why Argentina isn't paying them 10 years after walking away from its debt, right? And, you know, I debate whether to answer or not. And the answer is, you know, I feel your pain, but you can't make them do it, right? And um, that does wonders for, to, um, uh, for uh, you know, creditor coordination problems, right? Um, to some extent, there are also transactional techniques that um, help uh, diminish creditor coordination problems. It's worth noting, perhaps, that US state immunity is even more robust than foreign sovereign immunity, so that when it comes to states, the immunity protection is even stronger. Um, now, on the foreign sovereign front, um, there have been some recent decisions in the Second Circuit and uh, in courts around the world that may suggest that immunity is fraying. I think if that's the case, then the coordination argument comes back in full force and we need to talk about it. Another big argument is uh, there's a series of arguments um, that deal with kind of delay and chaos, right? Sovereigns uh, default or restructure too late. Yes, they get rid of their debt, but by the time they do, they have too much of it and um, any restructuring is likely to have tremendous spillover effects. They should have done it two years, you know, two months, six years earlier. Um, it may be because default is taboo. It may be because there is no process. Um, that is, uh, it's true that states restructure too late, but frankly, so do people and firms. Um, and it's not clear to me that countries with a bankruptcy option would file earlier any more than they would default or restructure earlier. The reasons for delay, as best I can tell from um, uh, recent literature in particular, uh, fear of spillover effects from default on currency, on banks. David mentioned some of this. Some of this holds in the U.S., some of it doesn't. But spillover effects aren't limited to bond contagion uh, driven by indiscriminate creditors. I think uh, Clay has pointed this out in his paper uh, very nicely. Um, Fear of chaos is also overplayed because the sovereign debt restructuring process has been for decades extremely predictable. So much so that one of uh, you know, international law scholars said in 2003 that 
we pretty much have customary international law that amounts to an international sovereign bankruptcy regime. Creditors are under no delusion that there might be default and restructuring. That's why sovereign spreads blow out, you know, in Spain and Greece, you name it, right? There is pricing. Um, and there are recovery values. Um, the uncertainty, I think, stems a little bit from this latent bailout option, to which I'll come back in a minute. Another problem, uh, but you know, again, concluding on that, I'm not sure how much bankruptcy would change things. Right? We have process certainty. We certainly have, um, uh, we have no reason to think countries will file earlier. Uh, and I'll return to the bailout point in a second. Um, then there's the fragmentation and discrimination problem. I think that's a real uh, problem and a serious one. The process may be predictable, but it is very piecemeal. Right, debt to governments, debt to multilaterals, debt to bondholders, banks, trade creditors, domestic constituents, is all restructured in different fora that are only loosely connected to each other. Um, moreover, um, the priority structure of government debt is fluid and uh, changes every so often ex post, which is quite unnerving. And this is the example of you know, the European Central Bank that managed to exempt itself from restructuring in Greece, but now says that any debt that it holds uh, in its, in, as part of its new program for you know, mostly Spain and Italy will go into a restructuring, right? So the fact, the fluidity of this process is, and the fragmentation is quite unnerving. The result is inequitable treatment and problems raising interim private financing, although I'm not sure that's necessarily a problem overall because interim financing has been forthcoming from the public sector. The solution, of course, is a centralized comprehensive process and a, an ex-ante priority structure, but that has to be enforceable, right? And that brings me right back to the immunity problem. We can have all the priorities we want, right? But it's not clear to me that unless you can figure out a way to make sovereign debt enforceable, um, any of these institutional features will help. A note on moral hazard. Um, and bailouts, right? I'm not sure that bailouts are all bad, right? We've had better justified bailouts and terribly justified bailouts. But more importantly, I don't think bankruptcy will eliminate bailouts. Um, the US auto experience certainly shows this. The European stability mechanism explicitly discusses um, debt restructuring as a complement to bailouts, as a quid pro quo. So I think in systemically important cases, we're most likely to see um, some combination of bankruptcy or formal debt restructuring and bailouts, and we need to think about how to reconcile this. The final argument is the process is illegitimate and captured by the wrong people. Now the Jubilee Coalition, the sort of left-wing NGOs, think that the debt restructuring process is captured by banks. Uh, you know, Newt Gingrich and Jeb Bush seem to think that it, the fiscal management process is captured by public employee unions. For better, for worse, the process is there, but it's captured by the wrong people. Um, my question is, how do we know bankruptcy will be captured by the right people, right? Um, those who cite mostly NGOs, again, Chapter 9, as a paragon of stakeholder inclusion would be shocked and surprised at the favorable treatment of revenue bonds in Chapter 9 relative to pension and wage commitments. Right, so it's not clear to me, again, that if we have bankruptcy, we're going to have... Um, bankruptcy doesn't lead you to justice automatically. Right? It would be nice if it did, but I don't think we can get there. Um, so in conclusion, you know, what do I think are the big problems? I think that the fact that sovereign debt is unenforceable is a problem. Okay? It creates all kind of bizarre... Um, uh, law and inconsistent outcomes. The fact that it is possible for Argentina simply to refuse to pay forever um, creates uh, incentives for bondholders to pursue increasingly bizarre tactics to interfere with payment systems and uh, twist contract doctrines. Right? So we have, uh, and moreover, immunity doctrines are inconsistently applied around the globe. So, you know, we have a military ship seized in Ghana that could never be seized in the United States. You know, what do we make of it? I'm not sure. We just had a Second Circuit decision, again, as I mentioned, that may uh, really put a dent in the immunity program altogether. Um, moreover, most of the world's debt is issued by rich countries under domestic law. Greece restructured most of its domestic debt unilaterally. It basically passed a law domestically that said, 
by the way, if you know all of our banks and a couple of banks we uh, reached agreement with, you know, vote, everybody who disagrees will automatically be swept into the restructuring. This was domestic uh, legislation that was retroactive. Okay. Another problem that David referred to is sovereign debt is not dischargeable. And again, I think that that's really unnerving. And unlike some of the problems I mentioned earlier, it's a big problem. Um, successive restructurings restrain, constrain autonomy, right? They detract from sovereignty. They impair sovereignty. Conditional bailouts do not help here. Yes, you need reform and oversight, um, but countries end up in these uh, um, sort of oversight programs, uh, conditional financing programs for decades with their governance capacity impaired. Um, fragmentation and inequality are real problems. Um, the process is unintelligible. It's known to a small group of elite participants, but people in the street who are marching in Greece or Spain or you name it, um, have no access to it and it's not intelligible to them. This process is not susceptible to democratic input. Again, a statutory approach or a treaty approach would be, um, I think would be more open to democratic input. Um, the last problem I see is authority and legitimacy, right? An IMF-centered process, um, a vertical process that is not um, democratically sanctioned um, is tied up with the legitimacy and governance battles of, uh, the that are with us uh, in the international system. There's no claim verification or legitimacy arbiter. Um, these determinations are generally self-judging. Uh, and Ecuador's example is certainly an interesting one. We can talk about that. Um, so in the end, I wonder, is there a bargain to be had where creditors get access to some discrete assets and revenues in exchange for discharge and more consistent, robust across the board immunities. If that is the case, then the bargain can serve as a platform for a centralized process and negotiating an equitable and enforceable priority scheme. Everything else flows from that. Um, this is precisely the conversation going on in Europe, right? Restructuring regime is a quid pro quo for debt mutualization. And David Skeel's contribution here, putting together questions of bankruptcy and federalism, um, is immensely important. I think we're going to be thanking him for years to come. But meanwhile, I thank you. And I hand it over to Clay. So um, <clears throat> let me, first of all, add my thanks first to the Frankel Family Foundation for funding this opportunity, uh, which I think is just a great chance to have a very important discussion. And also to the, uh, thanks to the Houston Law Review, um, the folks have just done a phenomenal job. I think we were talking last night about how well we've been treated. Um, the, everything has moved like clockwork and I'm greatly looking forward to working with them. Um, employers take note. I have to single out for thanks uh, Angeles Garcia, who put up with all my implorings over the last week um, and uh, always came through and always made the right decision. So Angeles, a special thanks to you. Um, David's paper, which I hope you all read in full, uh, uh, with his characteristic comprehensiveness ties together uh, multiple fiscal crises that we have domestically and internationally. Um, deals with, uh, along the way, deals with issues of federalism, uh, municipal debt, state debt, uh, hierarchical versus market structures for intertwining states and federal governments. He does this in the service of talking about a mechanism, a restructuring, a restructuring mechanism that he calls bankruptcy that can optimally resurrect a financially failing state. Um, he uh, brings into the conversation creditors, uh, states, employee unions, municipalities. In short, along with his other work, this is simply a tour de force. This is going to sound a little like a mutual admiration society, but I, I'm the one telling the truth here. Um, David has, uh, rare in the profession, uh, created a cottage industry. Environmentalists will be unhappy because of all the trees that have died so that law professors could re try to respond to or add to what David has said. Uh, but while environmental professors may be upset with him, people who teach in the various fields of federalism, local government law, municipal finance, uh, bankruptcy are all deeply in his debt. Um, what that means is that I don't have much to disagree with 
with David. I don't deny the possibility. And, and then he comes up and he talks about all this without looking at his notes, which I, I just can't do. So I'm going to be looking down a little bit because um, I don't have that talent. But uh, I don't want to deny the possibility the bankruptcy for states could generate substantial benefits. I want it essentially to extend his remarks a little bit and question some of his assumptions. What I want to focus on is what I call in my paper the byproducts of bankruptcy. What I mean by that is primarily strategic behavior by parties who react to the institution of a bankruptcy regime. That is, once we put a bankruptcy regime in place, if, if, if David were to have his way, what would the folks subject to that regime do? How would they strategize? How would they game the regime? And I think once we take that into account, then what David claims are the net benefits, although he sees the cost, what, what he sees is the net benefits of a bankruptcy regime might in fact be more uncertain. David predicate, predicates his, his preference for bankruptcy on the incentive effects of such a regime. He suggests that state bankruptcy could reduce politicians' short time horizons and dilute public sector union incentives for uh, underfunded upfront uh, payment, uh, underfunded payments uh, and might force them to, to uh, uh, seek salaries instead that would have to be recognized by present officials. He also speaks eloquently about the fairness of a bankruptcy system, that is its established basis of priorities, as he spoke about this, this morning, uh, treating everyone within a particular priority class equally. Um, I'm more skeptical that bankruptcy can solve structural problems that, leads, that lead uh, states to act in a manner that causes them to be in a position where they might have to invoke bankruptcy. Um, David may be correct that bankruptcy ensures fair distribution within the bankruptcy system. But once that system is created, and I think Anna was getting at this at the end of her remarks, those affected by it can attempt to engage in opportunistic mechanisms that place them in the best position they can possibly be in within the bankruptcy regime. So it's extremely important if we were to have a bankruptcy regime to think about what we can't think about, and that is the unintended, unintended consequences. Let me, let me spend the balance of my remarks just talking a little bit about some examples of what I might mean. So Anna, for instance, made a reference to uh, the priority that revenue bonds get under Chapter 9. That is, uh, under the current scheme, uh, holders of what are called revenue bonds, that is, bonds that are secured by an ongoing revenue stream. Imagine building a toll bridge with, uh, re with revenue bonds that is then secured by the tolls collected by people crossing that bridge. Um, those revenue bond holders are secured in bankruptcy. They are not subject to an automatic stay. Their funds don't go into the general pool of municipal assets. They get to continue to get those revenues even in a bankruptcy regime. One would think that if there were a bankruptcy regime uh, applicable to states, that you would see states moving to funding through revenue bonds rather than through general obligation bonds because that would allow bondholders more security. Now, that might seem like not a big deal, but that's going to have distributive effects. That is, a lot of projects that are currently paid for by taxpayers generally would then be paid for by users rather than taxpayers generally. So imagine, for instance, a library a, a, a currently funded by general obligation bonds now being funded by revenue bonds, and suddenly the free public library becomes a for, for fee public library, and under those circumstances you can imagine that it could in fact be um, uh, 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 some kind of uh, distributive effects that would uh, essentially constitute a tax and it would be a regressive tax. The state, uh, I want to go to now to another strategic possibility, the one that David mentioned, and that is the possibility that, this, that states could play the feds because of a concern to the feds that, uh, that bankruptcy would have uh, for the rest of the country. Now, um, first of all, David suggests that the contagion effects of a state bankruptcy are not substantial because the bond market is made up of a lot of smart people who can distinguish between a profligate and a non-profligate state. I think to some extent that's correct. There's going to be confusion at the margin, as was evidence when, for instance, New York City was, uh, was having problems not paying off New York City debt, but certain kinds of debt back in the 1970s. And similar authorities, uh, as far away as Michigan, suddenly evidenced much higher interest rates. So sometimes the bond market is not perfect. But there's another form of contagion, and that is contagion to the federal government itself. So that if a state, 
given the intertwining of the federal and state budgets that Dave was talking about, if a state declares bankruptcy and there's great uncertainty about the state's capacity to provide welfare services that are largely funded by the federal government, the federal government's going to have to step in. The federal government is going to have to provide a variety of services under conditions that are completely untested and that could be extremely expensive to the federal government. If that's the case, there is a form of contagion caused by this risk of state bankruptcy. And a state could use that risk to reduce conditions, or sort of the demand uh, from, the, from the feds, reduce conditions of a bailout by making the threat, if you don't bail us out, not with the harsh conditions you, the feds, want to impose us, but with the limited conditions that we're willing to accept. If you don't give that to us, we're going to take bankruptcy. Now, and impose the, these, uh, these externalities on you, the federal government. Now, David minimizes this for a couple of reasons. First, he says, well, right now there is that game possibility, gaming possibility between states and the municipal corporations, and municipal corporations don't always game the states. I think he's right. Municipalities don't always game the states. I think he's wrong. Municipalities sometimes do. So if we look at evidence from Camden, New Jersey, from Bridgeport, Connecticut, from Harrisburg, in each of those cases, the declaration of bankruptcy by the state followed immediately on an attempt by the state to, to impose harsh conditions on the municipality as a mechanism for, or, or as a condition for the state coming in and rescuing the city from fiscal distress. Well, David then says, as he said this morning, states can engage in strategic default now. I mean, state can just say right now, hey, bail us out or we default. Yeah, I think that's entirely correct. The question is, would that increase with the state bankruptcy regime? That is, could the mere, of, could the mere availability of bankruptcy actually increase state defaults and state strategic defaults? I think the answer may actually be yes. And the reason is, Right now, for a state to default would be an extraordinarily, extraordinarily remarkable act. It would be seen as an illegitimate act. States aren't supposed to do that. When states did that in the 19th century, they, they were deemed to be extraordinarily bad actors. Sometimes when someone, is, when someone has an option um, that is deemed to, that is enforced solely by a norm, you don't do that, but then you legitimize that, that action by saying, well, you can now engage in this action as long as you're willing to pay the related cost in the hopes that, that the imposition of that cost sort of reduces the incidence of the behavior. It actually increases the incidence of the behavior. Why do I say that? Well, there's actually been some interesting studies of situations like this. It's a, it's a fabulous study that gets played around in the literature enough that you wouldn't wonder whether it's an apocryphal story, of a, of a study of daycare centers. Daycare centers had um, barred late pickup. You had to pick up your kid by 5 o'clock. If you didn't pick up your, bad, your, your kid by 5 o'clock, you were a bad actor because it meant the teachers had to stay later. Well, there was a, a, enough of the bad acting that um, the school the daycare center said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to impose a fine on you. If you pick up your kid late, you have to pay. Guess what happened to late pickups? they dramatically increased. Why did they dramatically increase? Well, who knows? But the speculation was suddenly illegitimate behavior had become legitimate. You can engage in late pickup as long as you're willing to pay the price. So it just got priced. OK, I'm willing to pay the price. I'm not a bad actor anymore as long as I'm willing to pay the price. My great fear about bankruptcy is states that now engage in illegitimate behavior, or that would not engage in illegitimate behavior of bankruptcy would now, with, or, or of default, would say, hey, as long as we're going to pay the price of going to bankruptcy, we have a legitimate system. It's perfectly OK to declare bankruptcy. So that David's, David's notion that a bankruptcy system could actually reduce the need to use it, there'd be all this bargaining outside of bankruptcy, I think that's possible. It's also possible that we get just the opposite, that we'd get an increased level of bankruptcy. Parties might game the system in other ways. Once a bankruptcy regime creates a set of fair priorities, and David's quite right about the fairness within the system, parties might attempt to manipulate the category. So the re best recent example of this comes from uh, Rhode Island. Rhode Island, uh, a couple years ago, was facing, or no, Rhode Island municipalities were facing a huge amount of fiscal distress, especially one small little town called Central Falls. So um, what happened? Rhode Island cr uh, passed a statute that said, uh, that I'm sorry, bondholders of general obligation bonds got a first lien on all tax revenues payable to cities. Why'd they do this? They did this because the bankruptcy regime generally, and incorporated into Chapter 9, gives statutory lien holders, 
a first a higher priority in bankruptcy than just general creditors. So Rhode Island magically transformed all its general obligation bondholders into statutory lien holders. And what happened was when Central Falls came out of bankruptcy, the general obligation bondholders took a haircut of zero. The employees took haircuts of about 55% and the, and the residents got dramatically reduced services. How'd this happen? Bondholders, again, represented by smart underwriters and smart, smart bond counsel, uh, um, bondholders told the Central Falls, or told the Rhode Island legislature, do this for us, we'll never lend to you again. And Rhode Island was willing to do it. So essentially, the bondholders took a look at the, the conditions set forth for priorities in the bankruptcy system and then gamed them. Now, this can happen in any system. Any system is going to set priorities, and what it's going to lead to is strategic behavior on the part of potential bondholders. So my concern is we can't foresee everything that might happen once we put a bankruptcy regime into effect. We have to think about unintended consequences, but of course, by definition, we can't because they're unintended consequences. My final point uh, I want to make is about the relationship between bankruptcy and bailouts. David frowns on bailouts. Uh, for good reason. There's a huge moral hazard problem, though he does not endorse a strong no bailout policy. That is, he's willing to entertain the possibility, what if California threatens to default? Now, I know the answer out there, we're in Texas, might be, great, let it go. It's going to fall into the ocean in a few years anyway. <laughs> but, but, one might imagine the feds might actually want to intervene and save California from default because of those, extra, because of those contagion effects I was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, it, it, it seems to me our concern about bailout is somewhat overstated, and I say that for two reasons. First of all, there's little reason to fear too much bailout. History is against it. In the, uh, uh, David notes the disparity in credit ratings among states, and what that disparity in credit ratings means in large part is that there's, it's going to be very difficult to find a coalition for funding a bailout because Congress representatives from non-profit states are not going to want to bail out profligate states except if there is a real emergency. We saw this in the 1840s, the last time something like this was, was attempted. Uh, in the 1840s, uh, a variety of indebted states said, we need to be bailed out. And Congress considered it, and they voted it down. Why? If you look at the indebtedness within those, within those states, there was, there was sort of a bimodal distribution. A lot of states were deeply indebted, and a lot of states had virtually no debt at all. The, the non-indebted states were completely unwilling to bail out the indebted ones. Similarly, today, I think we might find um, that the non-profit states are unwilling, unless there's a real need to bail out the profit ones. A final point. Um, Obviously, the, the ability to bail out, the desirability of bailout is going to be tied to conditions. If you can really have harsh conditions, then maybe a bailout isn't so terrible. So imagine saying to California, we'll bail you out if you repeal Proposition 13. Or to Illinois, we'll bail you out if you, from now on, fund your pension obligations at 80%. And if not, here's what we get to do. Now, David says, in light of the recent National Federation of Independent Businesses case, that conditions would be upheld as long as the conditions do not intrude too deeply into state decision making. The claim I want to make is that's exactly what we might need. We might need federal intervention into, deep into state decision making, to which the response is the shibboleth of federalism. Can't do that. Our federal system precludes the national government from getting involved in those kind of state political processes. I want to suggest that federalism is greatly overstated in this respect. First of all, if the if the, if the objective of federalism is to have a strong bulwark of states against the federal government, those states, in order to be strong against the federal government, must be financially secure. So a federal constraint on a state that makes the, the federal, that makes the states themselves more physically secure can hardly be said to defeat the objectives of federalism. It's just this federal government paternalistically helping the states to help themselves against the federal government. Secondly, David mentions quite correctly that in the recent Supreme Court case, federalism was defined in terms of ind individual rights, not just states' rights. My guess is that very few residents of California have as their preference, preference that the state be profligate. 
Very few of them will think that their individual freedom is enhanced by, their, by the, uh, 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 the profligacy of the state. So again, my sense is if the federal government actually intervenes to place deep constraints on the state, that actually could enhance individual preferences and therefore individual rights. So if, uh, while I'm a big fan of federalism, I think we need to take a very nuanced view of federalism in this context and not treat it as, as something that we simply invoke to say the federal government can't do that without understanding the ultimate objective that would be that would materialize if the federal government did in fact do that that being deep intervention into the fiscal condition of states thanks very much look forward to the conversation I have about 20 minutes of responses so I'm going to try to do two minutes I'm going to skip most of my responses so that hopefully you all will have questions but um, if you don't have questions I threaten to start using up my 10 minutes um, of response. Um, one of the things you will have noticed from the two talks is that uh, really wonderfully, Anna and Clay both said they agree with me completely and my ideas are brilliant. And then there wasn't another thing they said that bore any resemblance to any argument that I was making. Um, so you should see them when they're disagreeing with somebody. Uh, it can get kind of um, violent. Second thing I'll say, is that when I discuss the state bank, when I'm on panels talking about state bankruptcy, I almost invariably get so frustrated with the responses uh, because they seem to me like such bad arguments um, that I dig in my heels even more. That I'll start out the panel thinking state bankruptcy is a pretty good idea. And at the end, I think the, the arguments against it are so bad that I think it must be a great idea because if these are the best arguments you can hear of, of, against it, um, uh, it, it must be pretty strong. I don't have those, that response to uh, either Anna or Clay's work, either as they've described here or elsewhere. Their uh, responses are very serious, and I, I mean, I, in one sense, I think I completely agree with their bottom line is we, we don't know for sure, you know, whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. And I think one way you could summarize our disagreement is, and this surprises me a little bit about Clay, but um, that, that uh, Clay and Anna, their instinct at the end is muddle through and a conclusion that politics probably aren't quite as bad as we think they are. That if we just muddle through, we'll be okay in the end. My instinct tends to be politics is pretty bad um, and I like formal sets of rules. I have a little bit more of a rule of law kind of instinct, I think. And I think we're not wildly far apart on particular issues, but we have a different bottom line. The second thing I'll say, which is really just playing that out, is that both Anna and Clay, Clay particularly talk a lot about unintended consequences of a state bankruptcy regime. What are some bad things that could happen? We could have, um, the politics could get more perverse. The wrong people could be controlling the process. Uh, both Anna and Clay made those kinds of points. I mean, it seems to me that that's true, but it also seems to me that you have to keep in mind that there are unintended consequences of the alternative as well. Clay is a big fan of taking tailored bailouts of, of, as an alternative to bankruptcy, Congress steps in, does something like what was done with New York City in the 1970s. Well, that's what we had, we've had in Europe over the last two years. We had a tailored bailout of Greece. Didn't work out so well, um, in my view. I think there were a lot of unintended consequences of the tailored um, bailout. I also disagree with Clay a little bit about the um, constitutional law implications. Uh, uh, Clay has some really nifty arguments about um, how taking away your democratic rights actually is improving you and, and is ultimately more democratic. I think this is because he comes from a city where the uh, mayor doesn't allow you to drink 20 ounce sodas. Uh, the idea is you may want to drink a 20 ounce soda, but it's not good for you and I'm actually enhancing your, um, your liberty by taking this um, away from, from you. I, I have some more comments on the particular issues, but each of these papers, these are terrific papers. They make really good arguments. I don't, I definitely don't have slam dunk responses to them. I have quibbles with them, but not slam dunk responses. So hopefully y'all will have some questions that we can, um, or we'll, we'll just fight amongst ourselves if you, if you don't. Yeah, and we'll just uh, take questions by raising your hand or. <laughs> 
uh, and Well, that is, that is a key argument, and that's, that's one of Anna's key arguments, and I, I think it's a strong argument. You might conclude we just don't need bankruptcy. The, the limitation of that argument, it seems to me, is what, a, what Argentina gets is not a discharge, and there is a real cost to them of that discharge. You know, uh, Argentina thought it had solved its problems seven years ago. They're still fighting in the Second Circuit about whether they've really solved their problem or not. What bankruptcy gives you is a true discharge. I mean, that, those, those debts are no longer owed if, they are, um, if they're discharged in bankruptcy. What you get, if you don't agree, to a restructuring. If you get a, you agree to the restructuring, you're stuck with the restructuring. But if you don't agree, in the absence of bankruptcy, what, uh, what you get is, uh, or what the, the sovereign gets, is partial satisfaction with, with the downside of never knowing if that creditor is going to figure out a way to make their life miserable for the next 10 years. And that's a drag. You know, it's not going to drag Argentina down, but if I'm in Argentina, having to deal with these hedge funds is a big hassle for me. Having my, um, my uh, military ship seized, you know, it's not going to make Argentina disappear, but it's a, it's a problem. So I, I think that's uh, that, that's my argument. I don't, Anna, you may have. I just want to add to this because this is um, this is the place where I've like totally moved into David's camp in the last few weeks. I guess, <laughs> um, sort of. Uh, so I think autonomy is a is a big um, argument here, and it really lack of the absence of discharge comes at cost um, to sovereignty. And the best place to see this is with the poorest countries. Um, they, get dis they get conditional debt forgiveness right, from other governments, multilateral institutions. Um, and they get these cycles of conditional debt forgiveness where more and more of their domestic policy is made by people other than their domestic politicians and policymakers and you know, voted on by their citizens. And now you might say, look, you know, these guys messed up and they keep messing up and so they deserve it and that sort of dovetails a little bit with some of what Clay said. But I think if you think that autonomy and sovereignty are at some level fundamental values, I think lack of discharge is a problem. So here's where I'm gonna accuse David of engaging in a, well, it's good for you argument. Um, <laughs> If the costs to the state of the current system of not having a mechanism of resolving this were in fact so high, you would expect that you'd have 50 governors on the steps of Congress saying, please give us a state bankruptcy act. I don't think we've got that. We do in fact have, as you suggest, the possibility that states could simply say, we're not gonna pay. That's exactly what happened in the 19th century. A whole variety of states simply repudiated their debts. Now, David suggests, I think quite correctly, that there are problems with, with that. That is, the one possibility is the state could then pick and choose who to pay. And the politics might well get, get deeply involved in who gets paid and who doesn't, and it would not lead to the fair distribution to which he, that, that he says will exist within a bankruptcy regime. And I think that's powerful. But a little history is helpful here. What did those states, in fact, do when they repudiated debts in the 19th century? Um, they did not tend to pick and choose. They tended to repudiate an entire body of debt as a whole, not to say, we'll pay this individual, but not that individual, or this group, not that group. However, there was one very interesting, this is kind of a fun historical footnote that I came upon, worth, uh, that makes this whole conference worth it, as far as I'm concerned. It's such a great historical footnote. When Tennessee repudiated its debt, it made an exception for bonds held by the widow of President 
James Polk and said that it would pay the bonds that she held. It also said it will, hold, will pay bonds held by, uh, by charitable and educational institutions. So the Frankel Found Family Foundation is going to be just fine for the bonds that they hold, and most importantly, so are universities. <laughs> Any other questions? Mr. Greer? Yeah, I had a couple, but I'll start to talk about the statutory first lane. That was something I was hoping someone would mention. I actually work in the capital markets at an investment bank. I am an attorney, so I'm here to be a non-practice attorney. But I, I work with clients, institutional clients, in investment markets and buying markets. One of the things is that there's about 20, maybe 22 states, if I'm if my research search is correct, that have a provision for statutory liens for GL debt versus another half of the states do not. You mentioned that, and I was wondering, in terms of, of, of creditors and investors, and even the dynamic of uh, looking at uh, are all GOs made the same or equal, is there that much difference between a state that really has it? I see it played out in Rhode Island where that particular GO, those bondholders were made whole versus in another state you may not get that and have that. Is that is that a risk? Is that something going forward that is an issue? Well, I, th I certainly think it, it, it should be an issue. Um, now, uh, Anna's written a bit about, uh, about sovereign immunity of states. So uh, even um, in, in, in some states, um, it, it's going to be difficult to recover uh, regardless of, of what your situation is. But I have some doubt about whether um, a state statute that creates a first lien on all tax revenues could possibly qualify as a statutory lien for purposes of the Bankruptcy Act. And David and I were talking about this earlier yeah. this morning. It would not surprise me at all to hear a bankruptcy judge say, listen, the term statutory lien in the Bankruptcy Act is a term in a federal statute which we get to construe. We are not bound by a state law that says this is a statutory lien. There might be a statutory lien for state law purposes, but that provision was put in the Bankruptcy Act to, um, uh, to save people with mechanics liens, to save people with tax liens, to save very discreet assets of the, of the, de of the debtor. The notion that this provision is now being used to create a statutory lien on all tax revenues of a municipality strikes me as inconsistent with the original uh, with the original understanding of why that statutory lien exception was put in there. It's now uh, now it's not it's the tail wagging the dog to an extreme. So um, it would not surprise me to learn that some smart bankruptcy judge ultimately invalidates or doesn't invalidate the statute, but says that is not a statutory lien for bankruptcy act purposes and. That actually strikes me as probably the right result, given what we've seen happen in places like Central Falls. Just, uh, I'll, I'll add a footnote. I, I agree completely with Clay about that. And, and Clay really is the expert on this issue, certainly. Not this Clay. <laughs> when, <laughs> if, if you want a simple rule of thumb, if, if he agrees with me, he's the expert. Um, <laughs> if he doesn't agree with me, he's dabbling in constitutional law and he shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, uh, but the other thing I'll say, this is something Clay and I also talked about, is the Rhode, Rhode Island passed a statute, as you alluded to and Clay also alluded to, that said, they passed it when it was clear Central Falls was going to end up filing for bankruptcy. And the, and the statute says, um, GO bonds have a lien on all the assets of the municipality. I think that that statute is subject to some constitutional law question, too. It effectively is changing the bond contract. And, it, and usually when you change a bond contract, the problem is you make it worse. You make it easier to restructure the bond. Everybody agrees that's a contracts clause problem. But I think changing a bond contract and making bonds better off could possibly be a, a contracts clause as well. Remember that, you know, I've thought about this as we spoke this morning, and the, the term is, uh, in the contract Impair. clause, impairs yeah. them. Yeah. Now, the argument you could make is, well, it impairs the contract with the employees because it reduces, right. it reduces the pool of assets available to them. But I think that's, 
I, I don't think that the fact that it benefits the bondholders. Yeah, yeah that may be. That may be right. That's a good point. But I'm just dabbling in constitutional law. <laughs> 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 I'm with them. <laughs> um, my understanding of bankruptcy law is a very uh, limited slide. So I apologize if it's naive. But what happens if, it, if bankruptcy proceeds are allowed and the state does file for bankruptcy? Are there any concerns about this limiting the state's ability to borrow in the future? And if it does, how, what kind of disparate impact would it have on public employees and those who need help from the states most? So I can start, this is as questions that are started that way usually are. This is a great question and a really hard um, uh, question. So I'll just say a couple things and then Anna and Clay probably have things to say. It is possible that it would impair um, the state's ability to borrow in the future. It's a little complicated though, because if you're a state that's in really bad distress and, um, and you're you're in danger of defaulting already, bankruptcy might um, not make your credit situation worse. It's possible it could make it better. I mean, that's what we see in consumer bankruptcy. It's actually easier for consumers often to borrow uh, immediately after bankruptcy than immediately before bankruptcy because their, their credit is in, in, um, in better shape. So that's one answer. And then second, relatedly, um, although this is also complicated, Historically, the evidence tends to be, and this is what Anna would know better than I do, that sovereigns, when they default, can go back to the market surprisingly quickly. So when Argentina defaults, it's surprising how quickly they can get back to the market, which suggests that punishment isn't as great um, as, as you might think, although there is a new article that Anna and I have both seen that suggests there may be a real punishment, and it may be that the, the prior st uh, studies are, um, are understating what the, the punishment is. So bottom line is, it's a great question, um, and it, it is an issue that, about which I think you can have different opinions. Do you want to add? Oh. Um, just a, uh, a little bit. The, the, the question in my mind is, what's the difference in the stigma between bankruptcy and default or just walking away from the debt, right? And um, because it's not like states don't uh, walk away from their debts. And, uh, and the answer t is, you know, it depends on what bankruptcy achieves versus what restructuring achieves. So for example, if you look at sovereign credit ratings, when they head into a restructuring and restructure, they're immediately downgraded, you know, it's selective default or, or um, whatnot, and then they're immediately upgraded. You know, there, there would be this, you know, week during which they'd be selective default and then they're back up and borrowing. So if the process, whatever it is, cleans up your debt, um, then you're fine. Um, and there might be an argument that, uh, you know, to the extent bankruptcy makes it more predictable, you know, maybe dot 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 question mark. Um, it might even it might be better, um, and people would be able to price it, and so there wouldn't be as much of a stigma, et cetera, et cetera. That in turn depends on how it's used, right? If bankruptcy is easier, if there's less of a stigma, well, is there more opportunism, and and that could start a, a negative cycle. So, um, so I think it's a hard question. It's interesting. The study to that um, we're talking about says that there is a reputational penalty for countries that extract really deep haircuts. So it's not so much just restructuring or not restructuring or just defaulting or not defaulting, it's how much do you take from the creditors that uh, affects how long you're kept out of the market. Now, I don't think it's a, a question of a binary choice of can you borrow or not. If you, you know, my sense is markets work pretty well in these areas. So I think it's a question of the price you pay for the prior default. Um, uh, Mississippi still has some unpaid bonds from the 1830s, but they can go to the markets. I don't think they're, they're probably not being punished much at all, 100 or almost 200 years later. Um, it, it, when uh, Washington Public Power Supply System in the 1980s was on the verge of defaulting, they were still borrowing. They were borrowing at 12 and a half to 13 percent in the tax exempt market, which means that they, if, you know, if you, you could take a pretty good risk and get a, if you were at a 50 percent income uh, marginal tax bracket, you were getting a 25% return on those bonds if they paid off and they were able to sell bonds on that basis. So I think there's a pricing mechanism that goes on that allows states uh, with some degree of punishment to get back. 
New York City, um, after 1975, was out of the market for a couple of years. When they came back, they paid a premium. Um, and the market, I think, has adjusted all that after this period of time. If I may follow up, David, I'm wondering if that uh, causes tension with your belief that bankruptcy could discipline creditors, because if creditors are willing to take the risk and just ha charge higher amounts, and if the demand for credit is relatively inelastic, does that, uh, it, it seems like you're agreeing with those, those points, uh, but I'm wondering. This is, this is a great question, uh, which I, uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't say every question is a great question. Um, <laughs> I, I get this question. Um, it took a while before I started getting this question, but I now get this question, and there's not a great answer. It's, it's a similar answer to all these, that it's a, on the one hand, on the other hand kind. And what I take the question to be is, uh, my, one of my arguments is that if a, if a state is a bad credit risk, its cost of credit will go up, and that will discourage states, at least on the margin, from borrowing. The counter argument, which Jim is raising, is, well, maybe they'll just keep borrowing and they'll pay more, and so bankruptcy will make things worse. That um, they'll do the same amount of borrowing, they'll pay more for it, so their debt situation will be worse rather than um, better. I, I, I do think that's possible. I, I think um, exactly what effect bankruptcy would have on credit prices is unclear. I mean, one effect would be if it really would reduce bailouts, as I think it would, or reduce the size of bailouts, I think that would raise the cost of credit, but I think that's a good thing. I don't like the bailout subsidy in the bond markets right, right now. But if it increases the likelihood of default, then it's going to raise the, um, the credit price, and it, it goes straight in, into your point. It's also possible that bankruptcy could help things by making an orderly restructuring more possible and, and lower credit prices on that margin. So we don't, we don't know how all this works together, but if it raises um, the cost of credit for a state, that could be either a good thing or a bad thing. And, and I'm, so I, I end by where I started, just saying it's a good point. And my proposal could actually make things worse if it ends up causing states not to change their borrowing habits and to pay more for their credit. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, I would just want to start by thanking the panel for coming and leading us in this discussion. And I appreciate everyone's attendance today. And especially, uh, we're thankful to the Frankel Foundation and the Houston Law Review for working together to make this event possible. Uh, so just join me in uh, thanking our panelists and the Houston Law Foundation, the Frankel Foundation. Thank you.